Hello everyone, I'm Bradley Sword, Assistant Professor of Computer Information Systems at the College of DuPage in Glen Ellen, Illinois. And this video today, we're going to be taking a look at hexadecimal basics. So we're going to look at how hexadecimal numbers are represented, and then we're going to also take a look at how we add and subtract hexadecimal numbers. So the worst binary joke of them all does not convert over into hexadecimal. So there are two types of people in this world, those who know hexadecimal and those who don't. It doesn't work. So when we're looking at any hexadecimal digit, when you're looking, you know, there are 16 possible this is hexadecimal, 16. So there are 16 possible values for a digit. Just like in decimal, there would be 10. In binary, there would be 2. The only difference is once we get past the 9, we don't have characters for 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So we supply the letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, and F for that. And just like every other number system, binary, decimal, octal, you name it, we read the digits left to right. The most significant digit is on the left-hand side, and the least significant digit is there on the right-hand side. But when we're talking about the digit numbers themselves, we're like, oh, what's digit zero? Then we start from right and we work our way to the left, as this chart A, 6E4 shows. Most significant digit is that A, because that is a large number we're multiplying there. And the least significant digit is the 4, because that's the 1's value, the 1's digit. So uh, that is what we do when we're trying to take a look at a number like any other number. These charts will take you very far in your understanding of the relationships between binary numbers, decimal numbers, and hexadecimal numbers, the, the topic of this video. So everything, every digit of a number in hexadecimal is a power of 16, just like a binary number is a power of 2, decimal number is a power of 10. So 16 to the 0th power, that's the 1's digit. 16 to the 1st power, that's actually the 2nd digit, that's, you know, that's the 16's digit. And then 16 squared is 256, 16 cubed is 4096, and this is where I start losing all my sanity, because who's going to remember these digits? So 16 to the 4th, 16 to the 5th, 16 to the 6th, 16 to the 7th. 16 to the 8th power is 4.29 billion. That is the 32-bit largest uh, unsigned value. So anyway, so the second chart, table 1.5 here, also shows you that relationship of how you can convert from one hexadecimal digit into a digit of decimal or a digit of binary. And again, other videos will show you how to use these charts and convert them accordingly, even so down below. Like, just real quick, like that's 1111 in hexadecimal. What is that in decimal if I'm reducing that down? And it's, you know, just because I see 1111, that could be binary. That could be any number system. Like sometimes it's good to know that, oh, we're dealing with hexadecimal. So as you see, you know, it'd be basically 1 plus 16 plus 256 plus 2,000, I'm sorry, 4,096. And then so the answer is somewhere in the 4,300 range, I would gather. I don't know the exact answer. It would be pretty easy to compute, but I'm not going to do that here. The ability to subtract and, in this case, add hexadecimal digits together is pretty much an important skill to have as a programmer. Because a lot of times we're dealing with raw memory addresses, especially in C++, or, you know, like elements of an array. We want to know how many bytes were there between elements. Sometimes we don't know. We actually have to do some math to figure it out. So these these slides should help you with that understanding of how to do the math. And it's very similar to everything we would do in base 10. We just have to understand and kind of click out of that fourth grade mentality when it comes to base 10 arithmetic that now we're dealing with that A, B, C, D, E, and F value components of a number. So like in this case, what you see here, 36 plus 42, that works exactly the same in hexadecimal as it does in decimal, but of course that 78 isn't 78, that 78 is a much larger number, somewhere around 120 uh, something, 110 or 120 something. So what you do, just like normal math, you choose 6 plus 2, that gets me an 8, and there's no carry, and then the 3 plus the 4 gives me a 7 with no carry, so we get 78. So it's like we're going to take a, a little more detailed look at the stuff we take for granted when we do our arithmetic, you know, the fourth grade style of arithmetic.
A second, slightly more complicated addition in hexadecimal is this problem right here. So in this case, 8 plus 5 gets me 13. If this were base 10, I'd throw a 3 down at the bottom and I'd carry over the 1. But in this case, 13 is one of the digits that I'm allowed to have, which is 13 converts to D from the previous slides. So 13 D goes down below, and there's still no carry. Again, we just have to kind of click out that fourth grade mentality. And then the second addition is 2 plus 4, which is 6, just like every other addition we've ever done. So 6D is the result of this problem. This time around we finally get to see the result of a carry when we actually overflow like we do in base 10. So in this case 8 plus 8 is 16. So 16 is actually two hexadecimal digits to represent one zero. So the zero goes down, that's the, you know, that's the remainder of the division, 16 divided by 16. So that's what we're doing every time we do this kind of math. So 16 goes, or 0 goes down below, and then the 1 carries over, and then now we're doing like we've done in fourth grade. So 1 plus 2 plus 5 gets me 8. So 28 plus 58 in hexadecimal format results in 80. One final example is just slightly more complicated only because we're using the A, B, C, D, E, and F components of hexadecimal that you might not be used to. So 6a plus 4b. So a plus b, that is 10 plus 11, which is 21. So 21, as reduced down into hexadecimal, is 1, 5. So the 5 goes down below, the 1 goes up and carries over. So 1 plus 6 plus 4 gets me 11, which just happens to be a b. So one thing to note, the largest numbers that you could add would be f plus f. So you're always going to carry over a 1. You're not going to carry over any numbers larger than a 1 because f plus f is 1e. E. 15 plus 15 is 30, and 30 reduces down to 1e. E. Hexadecimal subtraction works the same way as our fourth grade counterparts do as well. And again, it's hard to remember that we're dealing with base 16. So when we do like a borrow, we just got to remember different rules. So let's take a look at something like this. So C6 minus A2. They're like, okay, so 6 minus 2 is 4. That's totally fine. The 4 works just fine. And in this case, C minus A. They're like, C is a 12, A is a 10. 12 minus 10 gets me a 2. So then that works out just fine as well. So we don't have to do any borrowing. We don't have to do any fancy math. We just do our normal subtraction, and in this case, it works out. Here is a second example that will require us to borrow from one subtraction to the next. So in this case, 5 minus 7 would get me a negative 2. And as we learned in fourth grade, we don't do anything like that. We have to borrow from the digit over to the left to make this work. So if we were doing this in base 10, we just move a 1 over. And technically, we are moving just a 1 over from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So the 7 becomes a 6. We kick off, right? just like fourth grade. The only difference being when I'm borrowing that 1, I'm not borrowing 10, I'm, because I'm dealing in hexadecimal digits, I'm actually working with borrowing 16. So that 5, instead of turning into 15, turns into 21. 5 plus 6 gets me to that 21. So to go over this, so I borrow, the 7 becomes a 6, the 1 goes over, I add 16 to the number, so 16 plus 5 equals 21, and then now I can do 21 minus 7 gets me 14, which in this case is an E. And now I can move on to the next digit. So 6 minus 4 gets me my 2. And again, if you want to convert this over into base 10, it will work in any base system. So 75 minus 47 in hexadecimal gets me to my final result of 2E. Here is a your turn I'd like you to try to solve. So this is a real world example. So let's just say I had a memory address. I have a variable stored at this memory address, 400020. It's hex because I see the 0x out in front of the number. And you're like, OK, that's where this memory address, this is where this variable begins. And let's just presume it's an object. It's object-oriented programming because nothing is as large as the result's going to be here. So it says like the next variable, if I'm just using the space as compactly as possible, the next variable starts at 40006a. You're like, okay, so how big is this var1 variable and how many bytes of storage is it? 
we will see that most of the math just dissolves away the arithmetic, but we pretty much have to go right to left to prove that. So let's make a let's make do here. So the first digits off to the right, the least significant digits. A minus zero, ten minus zero is ten. So I don't have to do anything there. There's there's an A. And then a pretty simple solution here. So six minus two is four with no borrow. And then everything else just dissolves down zero minus zero, zero, zero minus zero, zero, zero minus zero, zero, and four minus four is zero as well. So what is the result of this subtraction but four A? And you're like, okay, well, what is that? You could either do that right now if you know how, of course, or check out the other videos that I have in this weekly series, and you will see that we can convert 4a into 64 plus 10. So this object is storing 74 bytes of storage, you know, for whatever it is that it's doing. So it's definitely not a normal data type. It's not a quad word. It's not, it's just this weird, it's got to be a structure of some sort. It can't possibly be a normal variable. So there you have it, the basics of hexadecimal representation, addition, and subtraction. And again, it takes a little, little work to get this memorized because base 16, again, is not something we deal with on a normal basis, but you will begin to use it on a more normal basis in the field as a computer programmer. So if you have any questions, you have any concerns, please make sure you email me, come into my office hours, get a hold of me somehow, and get those questions answered. So thanks for sticking through it. Have a great day, and I'll see you in the next video.